Cardiovascular System, the Heart, Part 2. In Part 1, we went over the conduction system. Again, the just to review, the impulse basically is going to originate in the sinoatrial node. It's going to cross over into the two atrium. It's then going to go to the AV or atrial ventricular node. From there, it goes through the AV bundle or the bundle of Hiss through the right and left bundle branches. And then eventually to the Purkinje fibers, which is going to propagate uh, an action potential in the cardiac uh, muscle causing contraction of the ventricles. Now the autorhythmic fibers in the SA node are the natural pacemaker. We also call it the anatomical pacemaker. And this is because this is what initiates the action potentials most often. If it's not available, other areas of the heart will become the pacemaker, but it, it's not going to be as effective as the SA note. Now the signals from the nervous system and hormones like epinephrine can modify heart rate and force the contraction, but they don't set the fundamental rhythm. So does that make sense? It's the anatomical pacemaker, basically the SA note, that sets the fundamental rhythm. Things like epinephrine, which you would know probably as adrenaline, can increase heart rate. Um, the nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, increases heart rate. Parasympathetic uh, nervous innervation would decrease the heart rate. Okay. And again, think of sympathetic as a fight or flight. You know, if you're fighting for your life, your heart rate's going to go up, right? Um, whereas uh, parasympathetic is rest and digest. You're resting, so the heart rate is going to be much slower at that point. Now, cardiac muscle generates ATP via anaerobic cellular respiration and creatine phosphate. And so just to show you the creatine phosphate here, <clears throat> it takes uh, ATP to break off a phosphate um, that's going to release energy and it's going to give us ADP. So what happens to that phosphate that snaps off the ATP? Well, that phosphate is going to phosphorylate the creatine. And that's what gives us creatine phosphate. So what's the significance of that? Well, the heart needs ATP. Well, how do we get ATP formed out of ADP? Again, ATP is adenosine triphosphate. ADP it is, is adenosine diphosphate. Think about rechargeable batteries. ATP is a charged battery. ADP is a dead battery. And you take a dead battery, put it in the charger, charges it back up, and now it's a charged battery. How are we going to charge ADP back up into ATP? Well, we have to add a phosphate to it. Well, where are we going to get that phosphate? Well, that phosphate is going to be stored in creatine phosphate. So if we need to phosphorylate ADP, we can pretty rapidly get that phosphate from the creatine phosphate, and that is going to give us the ATP. And that's going to be needed for to provide the energy, basically, for muscle contraction. Okay. And again, when energy is needed, that ATP is going to break off a phosphate. When it breaks it off, it releases energy. And now that phosphate can go somewhere like creatine and be stored up in creatine phosphate, ready to phosphorylate or recharge that ADP back into ATP. Now, if you remember from last semester um, during cell respiration, one of the ways that um, that energy is created or made um, is to phosphorylate ADP back into ATP. And we do that uh, through uh, the use of glucose. Okay. And so here is how 
ATP is generated again in the cardiac muscle. We have glucose and that can come from blood glucose or it can come from muscle glycogen. So glycogen is just um, a form of stored glucose that can be readily broken down into glucose ready for glycolysis. And remember glycolysis, we're breaking apart um, a glucose molecule. When we do that, we release enough energy to create four ATPs. But wait a second, to break something apart, that's going to take energy. So it takes two energies to snap the glucose apart. And so if we made four ATPs, but we had to use two of those ATPs, our product, our profit, is going to be two ATPs. Okay. And then that gets converted into two pyruvic acids. Um, and um, since this is anaerobic, this is pretty much where we, we stop. And uh, we develop lactic acid. That lactic acid goes into the blood, gets reconverted back into pyruvic acid, and so on. So this first one, the, the uh, creatine phosphate, is for duration of energy, which provides about 15 seconds of energy. Uh, this next one, duration of energy provided is about two minutes of energy. So let's look at the electrocardiogram, which we call an EKG or ECG. Now an EKG is a recording of the electrical changes that accompany each heartbeat. Now, we're not going to get into detail in uh, this class on how to read an EKG. That's an entire semester uh, class in it, on itself. So, uh, but what we will look at is some of the major events going on here. Now, because the heart is creating action potentials, that's an electrical energy. And if we put electrodes on the chest, we can pick up that electrical energy. And uh, this is kind of a typical EKG. Now the first wave is going to be the P wave. Then the next wave is a Q wave, an R wave, and an S wave. We typically call this a QRS complex. And then next is a T wave. Okay. Don't worry too much about PQ intervals, QT intervals, ST segments. All of those things are important when you actually learn how to read the EKGs and you take your little calipers and you measure those and they're going to tell you something about the conductive system of the heart. But in general, what's going on here is the P wave is when the atria contract or depolarize. Okay. Now think about a camera flash. When you flash that, uh, that camera flash, it goes off. That's depolarization. Um, and then we have our QRS complex. And again, that's like the flash going off. This is going to be ventricular depolarization. Now that camera flash, before it can flash again, it has to recharge. We call that repolarization. And then our T wave is going to be repolarization of the ventricles. So let me review that one more time. The P wave is depolarization of the atria. QRS complex is depolarization of the ventricles. And the T wave is repolarization of the ventricles. And so you're probably asking yourself, well, what happened to repolarization of the atria. Well, it's happening, okay? It's just that we can't see it because the QRS complex is such a major event, it hides over the wave that you would normally be able to graph during atrial repolarization. So does that make sense? So if we were able to go in and just put a, uh, a electrode, you know, right on the atria, we would probably be able to see that atrial repolarization. But again, the ventricles, it's such a big electrical event, it just covers over that repolarization event. Okay.
So let's look at the cardiac cycle. One cardiac cycle consists of the contraction or systole and the relaxation or diastole of both atria, rapidly followed by the systole and diastole of both ventricles. And this systole and diastole might sound familiar. When you take a blood pressure, for instance, you get a systolic number, which is the top number, and a diastolic number, which is the bottom number. And if you notice the systolic number is higher than the bottom or diastolic number, well, what that means is when we put a blood pressure cuff on, and again, we're gonna talk about this when we get to blood vessels, but when you put a blood pressure cuff on, um, you're, it's acting as a tourniquet and you're basically cutting off the blood uh, supply to, you know, the arm. And um, as you begin to release um, the air, you're listening for the blood to push past that cuff and uh, start going back down into the arm. And so that top number, that systolic number, is measuring the pressure that um, is found inside the blood vessel when the heart is contracting. So that's why we call it systolic, uh, because it's the ventricles are in systole, okay, or contraction. And that last number is the pressure inside your uh, blood vessels when the heart is relaxed. And so that's why we call it the diastolic pressure, because diastole means relaxation, okay? Anyway, we'll be talking about that again later on. And so what happens uh, during the cardiac cycle, we're going to have electrical events that take place, and we kind of looked at those with EKG. We're going to have pressure changes taking place. You're going to get heart sounds that match up with what's going on, especially in the during um, um, some of the mechanical events. Um, you're going to get volume changes. And then the mechanical events I just mentioned, this is where, you know, valves are opening and closing, hearts contracting and relaxing. And so let's take a look at a quick video. Ventricular contraction causes the atrioventricular valves to close, which signals the beginning of ventricular systole. The semilunar valves were closed during the previous diastole and remain closed during this period. Continued ventricular contraction increases pressure in the ventricles above the pressure in the aorta and pulmonary trunk, causing the semilunar valves to open. When the ventricles relax and their pressures drop, blood flowing back toward the relaxed ventricles causes the semilunar valves to close which is the beginning of ventricular diastole. Note that the atrioventricular valves remain closed. When the pressure in the ventricles becomes lower than the pressure in the atria, the atrioventricular valves open and blood flows into the relaxed ventricles. This accounts for most of the ventricular filling. The atria then contract and complete the ventricular filling. And so looking at the electrical events, we have, and again, this is a little review of what we've already looked at, but we have atrial systole in the P wave, and that's going to take uh, about a tenth of a second to occur. Then in our QRS complex, and notice that it takes, we're going to um, have the actual contraction pretty much right after the electrical event okay it's going to overlap a little bit but um, we get the electrical event then you know pretty much fractions of seconds uh, later the actual event takes place okay so again P wave we're going to have atrial systole it takes about a tenth of a, a second to do that 
Then the QRS complex is going to give us about uh, three tenths of a second. Okay. And then um, the T wave, again, is going to be the ventricular repolarization. So again, during the P wave, once more, ventricular, I'm sorry, atrial uh, systole, so atrial contraction. During the QRS complex, that's going to initiate ventricular systole or ventricular contraction. And then uh, the T wave is ventricular re uh, repolarization, at which point the heart is in the relaxation period and neither atria or ventricles are contracting. As far as pressure changes go, okay, if we look down here, this will be during atrial systole, the pressures inside the, the atria, okay, and the um, the green here is going to be the left atrial pressure. Okay, the blue is the left ventricular pressure, and that's probably the more important one um, to look at. But uh, the pressure, uh, at least for the atria, is going to increase. Okay, obviously because um, um, we're pushing that blood into the the, the um, from the atria into the ventricles, so that pressure is going to rise. Um, but left ventricular pressure is going to increase. Okay, and then during ventricular systole, we're going to again raise that pressure. And then during the relaxation period, after the, the heart is relaxed, that pressure drops quite a bit. Let's, let's look at the aorta because um, aortic pressure, that's pretty important because we're, we're pushing blood from the left ventricle into the aorta. And you can see here that the aorta has a certain pressure in it anyway. This is some back pressure. Um, when during ventricular systole we're pushing blood and that's what we're seeing in this blue here we're pushing blood out of the left ventricle now right here pressure is building okay but it, it's not moving volume yet okay and we'll talk about that in just a second with volume changes but uh, then it reaches a point where that aorta pops open and then again the pressure is going to continue because that ventricle is, is squeezing and it pushes that blood out of the ventricle once it does that again the pressure is going to drop but what happens in the aorta because we have a valve there once that pressure starts to drop that valve then closes and then we we get this little rebound effect and that's what we call the dichorotic notch and um, uh, the aorta is a large elastic artery so it has some elasticity to it so when you pump blood into it that aorta is going to expand and anything elastic you know once it expands it can contract back down again so this is almost like a bungee cord effect where as the, um, as the pressure starts to, to drop in the ventricles, um, then that back pressure is going to slam that aortic valve shut. And then we get that little rebound effect in the aorta. So we get a little bump in pressure and then it levels back off again. Okay, does that make sense? Pressure is dropping in the ventricles. And so the blood is going to start to backfill into the ventricles, but the aortic valve slams shut, stops that blood from flowing back, backflowing into the left ventricle. And we get that little elastic rebound, that dichrotic wave, and then uh, the aortic pressure stabilizes. That aortic 
uh, pressure would be similar to your systolic blood pressure. And so looking at heart sounds, um, we have first the S1 heart sound, and this is where the AV valves, the tricuspid and the bicuspid valves are slamming shut. Okay, and you're going to hear that turbulence. And then uh, the S2 heart sounds here are when the semilunar valves are slamming shut. And again, the semilunars are going to be your aortic and pulmonary valves. Now, S3, a lot of times you'll only hear that in sometimes in pathologies. Uh, S4, you usually only hear those in pathologies. Now looking at volume changes, the volumes we're going to be looking at are in the ventricles. So during atrial systole, the atria are contracting and pushing blood down into the ventricles, and so we're going to have an increase in volume. So at the end of the diastolic volume, um, that's what's represented right here. So volumes are increasing. Then during ventricular systole, remember the ventricles are contracting. So what are they doing with the volume of blood that's in them? It's pushing it out. So you're going to see that volume drop. And so here's our end systolic volume down here. Okay. And we'll look at milliliters here. So we're at about 60 milliliters at the end of uh, ventricular contraction. Okay. And during relaxation, well, there's just some passive filling of the, the ventricles. And you can see it here as it passively fills. And then we're back to the atria, uh, pushing some more blood into the ventricles. And that's where we get this little uh, peak again. So most of the filling of the ventricles is passive, again, during the relaxation period and then a little bit of extra uh, is pushed in um, when the atria contract. Mechanical events, again, atrial systole, the atria are contracting, pushing that little extra blood into the ventricles. Then we have, uh, during the ventricular systole, we have isovolumetric contraction. Iso means same. So the ventricles are contracting, but the volume is staying the same. Why is that? That's because it's, it's not ejecting it. Your AV valves here have closed. Okay. But we're not exerting enough pressure yet to open the semilunar valves, the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve. It would be like if um, you go to open up a door. Okay, and someone's leaning against the door. Okay, you start to push on the door, but nothing's happening. Even though you're exerting pressure, nothing's happening until you exert enough pressure that you can push that person out of the way, and then you can go through the door. So that's what's happening here. Pressures are building. The doors aren't opening yet. And then finally, enough pressure is exerted to pop it open um, the semilunar valves. It'll pop open the um, pulmonary valve, pop open the aortic valve. So where's that pressure coming from? Well, that's back pressure from the blood. Okay. When the heart stops contracting, that blood wants to flow back into the ventricles, but the valves stop it and keep it from doing that. Okay. So in the process of back flowing, it fills up the little cups of the semilunar valves, slamming them shut. And um, once you ex exceed the pressure, that back pressure, you're able to push that blood out of the ventricles. Then we have our isovolumetric relaxation, uh, relaxation. The heart's relaxing, but all of the valves are closed. And so blood is not um, basically um, changing in the ventricles here. Then when the heart, again, is relaxed enough to where the ventricles can open up, then we get that passive filling, again, of the uh, ventricles. Okay. 
And then during atrial contractions, we're back here again, the atria contract and push that little extra blood back into the ventricles and we start all over again. So that's the mechanical events. Now cardiac output is the volume of blood ejected from the left or right ventricles into the aorta or pulmonary trunk each minute. Stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped out of the ventricles in one beat. So stroke volume, which is milliliters over beats, times heart rate, which is beats over minutes. So we can cross out beats here. They cancel each other out, which is a good thing. I really don't like beats. Oh, that's a different spelling. Never mind. Anyway, then we have our uh, cardiac output. And that's going to be in milliliters over minutes. So again, cardiac output is how many milliliters per minute the heart is going to eject. And there's three factors that can regulate stroke volume. Okay, let's go back. What's stroke volume? Stroke volume is how many milliliters of blood are ejected per beat. So each time it contracts, how much blood is uh, actually being ejected. So three factors that regulate stroke volume is preload how much blood is actually put into the ventricles to begin with. Contractility, how strong is the heart contracting? Afterload, how much uh, blood is left over after the contraction? Is it an efficient contraction where it's ejecting most of the blood? Or is it a weak contraction? Uh, maybe somebody with like a congestive heart failure, for instance, might have a much larger afterload because the um, contractility of the heart's not very strong to eject out a lot of that blood. Okay, so all of those things are going to contribute to stroke volume. Now, as far as regulation of the heart, there's several factors that regulate the heart rate. We have the autonomic nervous system. Again, in review, Sympathetic nervous system increases heart rate. Sympathetic, fight or flight. Um, if you're going to fight or you're going to run away, the heart rate's going to increase. Um, the parasympathetic, rest and digest. You're relaxed. The heart rate's going to slow down. Hormones, such as epinephrine, are going to cause a, a sympathetic response where the heart rate is going to to go up. Ions, such as calcium, for instance, uh, can, can, can change uh, heart rate. Matter of fact, if you get too much calcium in the blood, you can start to have arrhythmias of the heart. Age is going to play a major um, factor in heart rate. Uh, gender will play a role, role in heart rate. Physical fitness plays a big role. Typically, if you're physically fit, especially your heart, cardiovascular-wise, uh, very fit, um, the heart rate is a lot slower. Normal heart rate, by the way, is about 60 to 80 beats per minute. If you're in really good shape, you know, it might be that, that lower number, you know, 60 beats per minute. Um, if you're like me, that's not so much uh, in great shape. I'm up in the 80s and 90s, so not a good thing. Also, temperature will affect heart rate. Uh, colder temperatures tend to slow down the heart rate. Hotter temperatures tend to uh, increase the heart rate. As a matter of fact, there was one time when um, I used to work as a, a respiratory therapist decades ago. And um, there was a patient that had had a head injury um, he was basically brain dead. They, um, the family went ahead and uh, 
donated his organs. So, you know, they kept him on life support. And I asked if I could follow along, you know, to the organ harvest. Uh, that's what they call that, where they're going to remove the heart and the kidneys and whatever else. In this case, it was heart and kidneys and eyes. And um, I remember, you know, them opening up the chest and everything and the heart's beating, you know, so I got to see that happening. And I remember them tying off all the major blood vessels ready to go. And, um, or at least they put the ties around the blood vessels. They didn't tighten them yet. But uh, they started pouring ice water, sterile ice water, onto the heart. And that started slowing the heart down. And so once they, it was, the heart was cold enough, it stopped. And that's when they said, go, everybody pulled on the, the ties that tied off the heart. Then they clipped the blood vessels, lifted up the heart, put it in a plastic bag, put it on ice, and off they ran to the helipad. Um, they were taking it then from um, Oak Lawn to Salt Lake City, uh, where that person was going to receive that heart. But it was interesting to see the effect that that cold temperature had on the heart. And that's what can happen with hypothermia. You know, I like to ice fish. I fall through the ice. Well, what happens is the body temperature drops. The heart starts to slow down. Eventually, the heart can stop. This is why um, if you go into emergency medicine or become an EMT or paramedic, they tell you that the patient is not dead till they're warm and dead. Okay, so in other words, if they're cold because they fell uh, through ice and um, they're hypothermic, um, there's a good chance of still reviving that patient. So, looking at nervous system regulation of the heart. Um, input to the cardiovascular system uh, from higher brain centers. We have cerebral cortex, limbic system, and the hypothalamus. Limbic system is your emotional brain. Think about that. If you get emotional or stressed out, your heart rate can go up. Okay, You can start thinking about things that uh, are going to maybe give you a little bit of a panic, um, and that can cause the heart rate to go up. Um, from sensory receptors, proprioceptors, it monitors movement. Chemoreceptors monitors blood chemistry. Baroceptors monitor blood pressure. Blood pressure goes down, for instance. The heart will start uh, beating faster, okay, in a stronger contraction to raise up the blood pressure. Chemoreceptors, uh, we're looking at um, oxygen carbon dioxide levels and pH levels. If your blood becomes acidic, um, then the heart's going to start uh, contracting faster. Okay, usually the acid is because of too much carbon dioxide in the blood. Too much carbon dioxide, we pump the blood faster to the lungs to exhale that carbon dioxide faster. And same thing with low oxygen levels. The heart will start pumping faster to try to get more blood to the lungs to pick up more oxygen. Okay. And then cardiac accelerator nerves, they're going to be sympathetic. It's going to increase the rate of spontaneous depolarization in the SA node and the AV node, and that increases heart rate. And then also increased contractility of atria and ventricles, uh, which increases stroke volume. And then the parasympathetic comes from uh, the vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10 where you get a decreased rate of spontaneous depolarization in the SA node and AV node, and that's going to decrease heart rate. Now, regular aerobic exercise is great for the heart. It can increase cardiac output. It increases HDL, which is the good cholesterol, the good cholesterol, okay? HDL, high-density lipoprotein, is what that stands for. Uh, it can help to decrease triglycerides, it improves lung function, it decreases blood pressure, and it assists in weight control. So one of these days I need to start aerobic exercising. Development of the heart. Um, as I'm 
mentioned before, a lot of times we'll talk about right heart versus left heart as if, as if there were two different hearts. Well, it starts off as two different systems. So we have our endocardial tubes. Uh, eventually they fuse and um, they form this thing that looks like a snail. Actually, the rest of these look more like snails. Um, but you have your primitive ventricles, your primitive atria, your truncus arteriosus, your bulbus cordis. And don't worry about these if you're in my class anyway. Um, I'm not going to test you on that, but just so you know how the heart begins to form, you get some torsion and some twisting, and eventually you wind up with um, the proper orientation of the heart. Now, this can um, cause problems sometimes with the heart uh, during development, and you can lead to problems such as tetralogy of flow. My father actually had tetralogy of flow, and that is a problem um, with uh, three three major problems basically with the heart. So um, but go ahead and look that up, Tetralogy of Flow, and uh, see what those uh, problems are. And you can see that um, this is probably the, the time when those problems arose. Now fetal heart anatomy is a bit different and fetal circulation is going to be a bit different um, than, uh, well, basically uh, right after the child is born. But um, I'm going to go ahead and address that in a separate video. Now disorders of the cardiovascular system, of course, coronary artery disease and coronary artery disease can be atherosclerotic placking. Um, athero refers to uh, the blood vessels. Sclerotic means hardening, so this is hardening of the arteries, basically. Uh, again, that uh, restricts how much blood flows through the coronary arteries. And if enough blood flow is cut off, then that heart muscle dies and you have a, a myocardial infarction or death of uh, heart tissue, and that's a heart attack. You can have congenital heart defects, such as uh, tetralogy of flow that I mentioned earlier, you can have an atrial septal defect. Um, normally in the fetus, the, um, there is a hole that goes from the right atrium to the left atrium. And um, we call that the foramen ovale. Okay. And as a fetus, you don't really need your lungs to to get oxygen, right? You're getting your oxygen through the umbilical cord from your mother. And so this is a way to bypass uh, some of that blood and keep it from going uh, to the lungs. Now, some blood does go to the lungs. We need that just to make sure the blood vessels are actually working. So when the child is born, um, but some of that gets shunted from the right side of the heart to the left side. We call it a right to left shunt. Once the baby is born, that little flap that's there closes and seals it off. And um, so the blood from the right side of the heart goes to the lungs. Blood on the left side of the heart goes to the body. And um, that then becomes what's called the fossa ovalis. Now, if that um, doesn't close, then the unoxygenated blood on the right side, which is supposed to then go to the lungs to get oxygenated, goes from the right side to the left side, never gets to the lungs, and you can have what's called a blue baby. And that's because the baby is cyanotic and not getting enough oxygen because of that defect. We can have arrhythmias. Um, one arrhythmia that they advertise a lot on uh, TV is atrial fibrillation. That's where the individual cells of the atria just kind of quiver. Um, it's not as serious as ventricular fibrillation. That is where the heart stops pumping altogether, and you have to run and grab one of those machines called a defibrillator and then shock the patient. Um, when you put electric impulse into the chest, that causes all the heart muscles to contract at the same time, 
then you take away that electricity, they relax at the same time, and hopefully start beating in sync again. Okay, but the problem with atrial fibrillation is because the um, atria are just kind of quivering, um, that can allow blood to start to get caught up in little turbulence there and clot. So that's the high risk for that. Other arrhythmias can be, you know, skipping of heartbeats. It can be the heart is racing too fast. Uh, the heart is too slow. It can be an irregular heartbeat. So there's a lot of things that uh, fall under arrhythmia. And then congestive heart failure. What happens in congestive heart failure is um, a lot of times this comes about due to um, some kind of resistance in the vasculature. It could be atherosclerotic placking, for instance. In other words, the left heart, which pumps to the body, is contracting against resistance for so long that it starts to put back pressure on those ventricles and starts to enlarge the ventricles. Which means if blood is not getting pumped out of the left side of the heart, then the blood coming from the right side and going through the lungs is also now pumping against pressure because it's trying to pump into the, uh, the well, the, the right side of the heart pumps to the lungs, and then from the lungs it goes to the left side of the heart. There's this back pressure now that takes place, and it's going to start to increase pressures in the lungs. So you get what's called pulmonary hypertension. And then that's going to cause the right side of the heart now to enlarge and those ventricles to become stretched out. So you get what's called left ventricular hypertrophy that leads to right ventricular hypertrophy and then eventually to cardiomegaly, which means an enlarged heart, and it's ineffectively contracting. So where does the congestive part come in? Well, because there's all this back pressure in the lungs, for instance, causing pulmonary hypertension, then some of that fluid, you know, some of the plasma, some of the water in the, that makes up the blood, starts to get pushed into the lungs. Okay, Some of the blood actually gets kind of pushed into the lungs as well. And so somebody with congestive heart failure uh, can then go into pulmonary edema. Okay, so that's kind of a kind of a serious complication of congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema. When you listen to a patient with pulmonary edema, a lot of times you don't even need a stethoscope, but when you do, it sounds very foamy and frothy. And that's exactly what it is. When the patient coughs up and spits out that, um, that uh, phlegm, it is going to be very frothy and usually pink. So pink froth will be indicative of, of uh, pulmonary edema brought about by congestive heart failure. And then you're also going to see swelling in, in limbs as well again, because of that back pressure that's taking place and the ineffective uh, pumping of the blood uh, throughout the body.